Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I am your host, Catherine Hadro, in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thank you for joining us. In this week's show, we speak out against a pro-abortion Pennsylvania state representative's disgraceful display of bullying. A pro-abortion actress makes an accidental case for abstinence. We address the role of chastity and sexual integrity in the pro-life movement and this. They can expect hope. They can expect to be, to be greeted with, with care, with skill, and, and especially with love. We introduce you to a line of pro-life facilities where women truly are at the center of their care. But first, our top story, a third Democratic governor rejects Born Alive legislation to protect babies who survive abortions. Montana Governor Steve Bullock last week vetoed the state's Born Alive Infant Protection Act, which would have protected babies born alive from failed abortions. This week, Bullock announced he is seeking the Democratic presidential nomination. Bullock's veto follows North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper's veto of similar legislation. And Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers comments that he rejects the Born Alive bill in his state. For a reaction, we speak with a governor who affirms life. Governor Matt Bevin joins us now from Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome back to the show. Great to be with you today. It really is. Governor, we have seen in recent days and weeks three governors, all Democrats, reject their state's version of born alive legislation, which protects babies who survive abortions. The governors of Wisconsin, North Carolina, and now Montana. Do you have a message to your fellow governors who have rejected this legislation? Again, I can't speak for another person. I can speak for my thoughts on this. The arguments that I've heard that it somehow doesn't serve a purpose, that it's perhaps redundant, that we already have such laws on the books. I'm not sure that we do, and that argument is fairly weak. It would seemingly be the same argument you might say for why have airbags in a car, because we already have uh, a seatbelt. Mm. Uh, to, to protect a human life and to ask a doctor to take responsibility for protecting that human life and to hold them accountable if they do not, especially given that they have taken an oath to do so, and in fact uh, are licensed to do so, would be irresponsible. And I would just encourage governors, be bold. Don't be politically opportunistic. Don't be beholden to outside interests that are gonna help you politically, but be bold and do the right thing. All of this discussion of Born Alive Bill comes in the wake of extreme abortion legislation we are seeing pop up in various states, including in New York. Governor, what role do states' rights play in defending the sanctity of life? What can be done at the state level? Well, if you look at the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, it says that these particular uh, responsibilities of the federal government, not spelled out in the Constitution, are the responsibilities of the states and of the people. And prior to Roe v. Wade, that's exactly how this particular issue is handled, the question of life and of abortion and the delivery of abortion. But Roe v. Wade read into the Constitution through penumbras and emanations, things that didn't actually exist there. It was a travesty of the, the court. And uh, the net result of it was uh, the decision to take away from the states the responsibility that was theirs. I think this will ultimately be returned back to the states. In the meantime, states like ours have passed very uh, intentional laws related to things like informed consent and ultrasounds. We won this uh, at the Sixth Circuit. We've also had laws passed against a 20-week ban. That has not been challenged. We've had laws uh, passed that would outlaw the incredibly brutal uh, practice of dismemberment mm -hmm. of a live uh, baby in the womb. Uh, and then we also have a couple of more recent bills as well, a heartbeat bill uh, that is being challenged right now in federal court. Uh, and then more recently one that I think will make its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and may be very well involved in the ultimate decision making as it relates to Roe v. Wade. And that is a non-eugenics bill. We passed a bill here mm -hmm. in this past session in Kentucky that says you can't kill a child based on its race, based on its gender, 
or based on some perceived disability. We used language very similar to what we find in the Americans with Disabilities Act and other federal statutes that are already on the laws and already on the books, I should say. I want to come back to that bill shortly, but first, and what is good news for the pro-life movement? We just saw Georgia Governor Brian Kemp sign a heartbeat bill into law in his state. Can you, Governor, speak to the pressure that pro-life governors face when signing pro-life bills into law? There is pressure, of course, politically. But here's the, the thing, and I think so many of your viewers understand this. To do the right thing is the right thing. And sometimes, of course, in pol politics and in other areas, it's easier for some to do the easy wrong than to do the difficult right. But I think we have a moral obligation, uh, and for many it's maybe a religious obligation, but I think even uh, for those for whom it's not religious-based, it's moral to mm -hmm. save a human life. As our founders understood, we were endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights that government has no ability or right to take from us because they did not give them to, the, to us. Absolutely. And Governor, as you mentioned, you recently signed a bill banning abortion based on the baby's gender, race, or a prenatal diagnosis of a disability. And now the ACLU is suing. Governor, why is this bill necessary and how do you plan to defend it in court? It's interesting because I think the... Uh, the guild is coming off the lily uh, on the other side of this issue. For so many years, people made the commentary that, well, we want it to be rare. They don't really want it to be rare, and now they don't even say that anymore. They're not mm -hmm. pretending that anymore. And so the ACLU, among others, is quick to sue, as are attorney generals. I've been sued on many of these by my own attorney general, and in fact, he refuses to defend these, even though they've been overwhelmingly passed by our legislature. I think the reason people are doing this is because they're beholden to the pro-abortion industry that pays a lot of money to politicians. Planned Parenthood is a big disseminator of monies to get people elected because this is a very profitable uh, business for them. And so what is it that, that folks like myself can do? Just continue to stand firm. We have a responsibility to do so. Are we going to be sued? Yes, that's okay. We are standing on the side of what is right. And just as there have been laws of the land overturned in the past, like the Dred Scott ruling of 1857 that said blacks were not human, that they were two-thirds of a human, that they could be bought and sold and treated as property, there were people that were outraged and said this is not right. The same battles are going on today. And just because it has been previously ruled upon does not make it right. And so we are standing firm and we will continue to do so regardless of the money and the reasons and, the, and the, just the evil, frankly, uh, that is opposing us on the other side of the equation. Right. And finally, Governor, we only have a minute left. I'd like to get your quick reaction to recent video that's been circulating of Pennsylvania State Representative Brian Sims harassing a woman who is praying outside of a Planned Parenthood. As a husband and a father of nine, what do you want to say to pro-abortion men who harass and bully? Grow up. Uh, you know, really act your age. This kind of irresponsible behavior and, and then streaming it, filming yourself, this sort of voyeuristic, uh, narcissistic approach uh, to trying to garner attention for yourself uh, is pretty pathetic, frankly. And I would encourage those uh, that were on the receiving end of that to prosecute that to the fullest extent of the law. It's inexcusable for somebody in elected office or otherwise. But if you're going to be an elected official and represent people, um, do it like an adult. Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin, thank you for your pro-life leadership. You're welcome. To continue our conversation, we're joined now by Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and now the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. Congresswoman, welcome back. It's good to be here. What was your reaction to this latest veto of the Born Alive legislation? Well, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful. It's amazing. When you poll this, people really get it. Mm -hmm. A little baby that survives a failed abortion deserves the same care that any other little preemie would get. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's amazing that someone could be this hard-hearted. What role then can a pro-life governor have in upholding the sanctity of life at the mm. state level? Well, they can make all the difference in the world. Mm. You know, I was in the state legislature in Colorado, and uh, the governor is the head of the state. And if mm -hmm. a governor is pro-life and going to sign pro-life bills into law, like Matt Bevins mm -hmm. in Kentucky, oh my goodness, they've banned dismemberment abortion. 
They've banned abortion that would discriminate against a baby based upon its sex, race, or disability. The heartbeat bill has been passed. So it sends a signal to the legislature, I'm here for you and I'm gonna sign those bills into law. Very different mm -hmm. than what Governor Bullock did in Montana. And you know, I thought he was looking to have his image be one of a moderate. Hmm. But that is, uh, you know, vetoing Born Alive, that's not a moderate position. It's very, very extreme. Very extreme. And Congressman, we are seeing Democratic presidential candidates get asked about Born Alive legislation, and they are just flat out denying that this kind of legislation is necessary. So what advice do you have for viewers if they hear that kind of talking point from others? Well, first of all, don't accept that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not very good report on abortion from states and there's a reason for that you know the pro-abortion crowd doesn't want voters to know what has happened in their state but we do know from the Center for Disease Control that between 2003 and 2014 there were at least 143 babies that were born alive during attempted abortions we do know that in the last few years over five states there have been like 23 babies born alive and in Florida alone in 2018, there were six babies that were born alive and we don't know what happened to them. Mm. But we do know that they should be given the same care that any preemie would receive. We need better reporting across the country. But yes, it is factual that babies survive abortion and those precious little babies deserve medical care. Absolutely. And finally, you were at that massive pro-life rally in Philadelphia last week in response to State Representative Brian Sims' harassment of pro-lifers praying outside of a Planned Parenthood. What was your message there at that rally? I'm appalled mm -hmm. that a state representative would act that way towards an older woman, mm -hmm. uh, towards teenage girls. And how sad it is, though, that he is so angry over this. And here we were. I mean, I couldn't see the end of the crowd to my left or to my right. It was a beautiful crowd of pro-life people, uh, very loving, very gentle, but very firm in saying, we will be here. We will be praying on the sidewalks. We will be defending innocent life. We're not going to go away, mm -hmm. even if you bully us. That is powerful. Thank you so much for being there and for being here. Marilyn Musgrave of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you for being here. It's always great to be here. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. In recent weeks, we saw Pennsylvania State Representative Brian Sims harass and bully pro-lifers who were prayerfully protesting outside of a Philadelphia Planned Parenthood facility. The pro-life movement was quick to respond and in a peaceful way. About 1,000 people gathered last week at the rally against bullying. It was a beautiful example of how the pro-life movement is a movement of love. But it doesn't take away from the real pressures and challenges facing sidewalk counselors and those in the front lines of the pro-life movement, like those who were harassed by Representative Sims. That brings us to this week's Call to Action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and pledge your prayers for sidewalk counselors. Unfortunately, the recent harassing incident we saw by Representative Sims is not an isolated case. Pro-lifers who pray outside of abortion facilities are frequently mocked and bullied. It takes real courage to stand up for life in the face of opposition. If you go to ProLifeWeekly.com, you can pledge your prayers for our brave sidewalk counselors. Make sure to pledge your prayers. Let's try to get as many as possible so we can let sidewalk counselors know how many people are praying for their work. Groups like Sidewalk Advocates for Life and 40 Days for Life. Pledge your prayers by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to our next segment, a pro-abortion actress makes an accidental case for abstinence. Actress Alyssa Milano tweeted on Saturday, until women have legal control over our own bodies, we just cannot risk pregnancy. Join me by not having sex until we get bodily autonomy back. I'm calling for a sex strike. Pass it on. This so-called sex strike is a protest to Georgia's pro-life heartbeat bill being signed into law. Milano has been outspoken in her pro-abortion views and opposition to the pro-life law, even calling for a Hollywood boycott in the state of Georgia. Her suggestion of a sex strike was scoffed by many abortion advocates, but gained some unlikely support from pro-lifers. Here's how live action's Lila Rose responded. 
I'm totally with you, Alyssa Milano, on not having sex. But the issue isn't reproductive rights. The issue is reproductive responsibilities and fidelity. No one should have sex until they're ready to embrace the privilege and responsibility of lifelong commitment and raising a child. Joining us now to discuss this is Christina Barba, president and founder of The Culture Project, an initiative of young people set out to restore culture through the experience of virtue. Welcome to the show, Christina. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. When you heard actress Alyssa Milano is calling for a sex strike in protest of Georgia's pro-life law, what was your reaction? Well, I got to say, ironically, Alyssa hit it, the nail on the head, at least in some aspects. I have to agree, it's like she accidentally stumbled upon this connection mm -hmm. between our sexuality, that intimacy, and new life, and babies. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. I think there's a few things that are um, not fully connected there, but I think it's an interesting connection that she makes that a lot of the world doesn't even like to make. Yeah. If you had to connect the dots yourself, what would you wanna to say to Alyssa? Well, I'd want to say, Alyssa, sister, you are right on in wanting women to have bodily autonomy. Mm. Completely agree with mm -hmm. that. And I think what she's actually searching for and longing for deep down inside is actually a call to chastity. Mm. And, you know, I know we've talked about these issues before, Catherine, but chastity and abstinence aren't even exactly the same thing mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And chastity is about a total yes, an integration of mind, body, soul of our sexuality. It's not negating it. It's not discounting it. It's actually owning it. And actually, each and every woman does have that right to own her body and that right to be a master mm -hmm. of oh, her own body. But there's a time and a place in which sexuality is meant to be shared and expressed. And I think it's sad that she has felt that she hasn't actually had mm -hmm. that bodily autonomy until now calling for a sex strike. Yeah. The fact that she needs abortion to feel that she actually can have a mastery of her own body. Christina, then, in this day and age, how do you even begin to communicate the truth of chastity and abstinence to our culture and teach people that it's truly empowering? Yeah, absolutely. I think at the end of the day, it comes back to self-respect, dignity, value, worth. Mm. Actually valuing your own self, your own life, and others. And as Lila said, it's about this commitment, a lifelong commitment of fidelity, being open to new life, that in that context, sexuality is a great gift and not a burden, and not something that we need abortions rights mm -hmm. to support. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your group, The Culture Project, and how you are teaching the good news of chastity to others. Well, day in and day out, myself and a group of about 30 young adults across the country are living in community, making prayer commitments, and attempting to live lives of virtue and inviting other young people to join us. The chastity message is one of the key parts of this. It's one of the integral pieces of this, mm -hmm. owning and understanding our sexuality. We, on a daily basis, invite teens and young adults to realize that their life has purpose, dignity, value, that we were made out of love, that we're made for love, and that God has a plan for us. And that chastity is not meant to be an oppression or a mm -hmm. slavery, Mm -hmm. but actually an opportunity to be free, to, to know who you are and to make a gift of yourself. I think when it's only a theory, it's hard to understand that I could do this. But when you meet other young people that are maybe just a little bit older than you, living full, joyful lives, mm -hmm. it kind of gives you like an image and it makes you think maybe... I can try, why not? Maybe I could have that freedom. Maybe I could have that joy. Thank you for your joyful witness, Christina Barba, president and founder of The Culture Project. Thank you, Catherine. When we come back. It's encouragement that you can do this, you know? We're all in this together. Hear how a line of pro-life centers encourage and empower women to choose life. Stay tuned as EWTN Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break.
Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm your host, Katherine Hadro. A state representative in Pennsylvania recently harassed peaceful pro-life protesters outside a Philadelphia abortion clinic. That's this week's Speak Out segment. So here's the deal. I've got hundred dollars to anybody who will identify any of these three. So we're I'm going to donate gonna to Planned Parenthood. I'm going to donate to Planned Parenthood. So look. That is video of Pennsylvania State Representative Brian Sims harassing pro-lifers who were peacefully praying outside of a Planned Parenthood facility in Philadelphia. In the videos that have since gone viral, Sims offered money for the names and identities of three teenage girls. There's also video of him harassing an elderly pro-lifer praying the rosary. The pro-life movement was quick to respond. Last week, an estimated crowd of over 1,000 people gathered outside the same Philadelphia Planned Parenthood to showcase the pro-life movement is a movement of love. The rally was led by pro-lifers, including Abby Johnson, Matt Walsh, and Lila Rose. We are here because we stand for the dignity of every human life. We are here because we do not cower to bullies and harassment. We are here because we share the commitment to fight for life. The pro-life movement showed State Representative Brian Sims we will not cower to his bullying, that we stand strong together, and that we are a movement of love and peace. Sims was invited to attend the Philadelphia rally and to meet the very pro-lifers he bullied, but he did not show. He has since locked his Twitter account, blocking transparency and preventing others from seeing what messages he's now posting on the social media site. As a lawmaker, Sims claims he stands up for women, Yet he took video of himself harassing women, and he advocates for abortion, which we know is profoundly anti-woman. It's obvious State Representative Sims is full of contradictions. I hope and pray that the pro-life rally touched his heart and pricked his conscience so that he will use his power as a lawmaker to defend the unborn, his most vulnerable citizens. Let us, as pro-lifers, continue to be examples of peace and invitation so that maybe one day, State Representative Brian Sims will go from harassing us to joining us. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and pledge your prayers for sidewalk counselors to show your support. A group of pregnancy centers have found a powerful way that empowers women to choose life by truly putting women at the center of their care. Here is this week's Pro-Life Focus. And we are thus honored to, de to bestow on the Women's Care Center the 2019 University of Notre Dame Evangelium Vitae Medal. What once started as a simple mission 35 years ago is now being recognized for the major pro-life success that it is. The Women's Care Center is a chain of pregnancy resource centers, first founded in a tiny blue house in South Bend, Indiana in 1984, by Catholic professor Janet Smith. In its first year, the center served 300 women. This year, they'll serve 30,000. I met up with the vice president of the Pregnancy Resource Center to see their Baltimore location and to hear more about their mission. This is our ultrasound room. Oh. At Women's Care Center, we walk with women from the moment they find out their pregnancy until they send their child off to kindergarten. That continuum of care, that continuum of support and love and concrete help is very real. With 32 centers located in 11 states, Women's Care Center claims the title of the largest and most successful pregnancy resource center in America. But the pro-life group ran into an unexpected roadblock last spring when their plans were halted by South Bend Mayor and Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg. The Women's Care Center bought a building next to a new abortion center in South Bend and needed a simple rezoning of the property to operate. It was approved by the city council, but then vetoed by Mayor Buttigieg. We were um, terribly discouraged and, and felt defeated by that. But within days, we got a message from the owner of the building across the street, 30 feet away, who said, if you want to open, you should look at my building. They did just that and are now looking forward to serving even more women at that location. Placing the centers right next to abortion facilities 
is all part of the Women's Care Center's winning strategy. Next door saves lives. And the reason that it saves lives is because often women who find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy don't know that they have another option. The statistics are stunning. They are saving lives. Not only do more than nine out of 10 women choose life, the abortion rates in the communities that we serve drop dramatically. So in our home community of, of South Bend, um, St. Joe County, the abortion rate since we've opened has dropped 75%. That is real care. But Women's Care Center is quick to share the real reason behind their success. The real secret is love. That's what's great about the Women's Care Center. It's so welcoming and so beautiful that when people walk in, they just automatically feel at home. Catholic mother Liz Walls regularly volunteers at the Baltimore Center. She's seen firsthand the positive impact it can have on women who walk in these doors, where all for free, they can receive baby clothes, diapers and supplies, counseling, an ultrasound, and attend parenting classes, which Walls teaches here. My big message, no matter what the topic is, is just to encourage them in their parenthood. In their parenthood. That's exactly what we all need as parents, is just encouragement. You know, um, all the, the resources are out there, you know, to find out information about bathing, you know, routines, manners, reading, all the important parts of being a parent. But really, it's encouragement that you can do this, you know. We're all in this together. It's even become a family affair, with her children also coming to serve. I feel happy to support somebody and having them live a proper life and not having that ended so quickly. Just feeling like you made some, like help someone have a child or help them just get something or and like taking these clothes and putting them on wax or taking diapers and like thinking that, wow, someone's going to have this and they can dress their child today and they can feel like they actually have something for their kid and that they're going to have a good life. From the littlest of helping hands to the top executives, it's clear that this group puts women front and center. When the culture might be saying, no, you can't do this, you know, this is not encouraging you to do that. Women can't you know, experience a difficult pregnancy and come out on the other side. And the Women's Care Center is here to say, yes, you can. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. We'll see you next week. Until then, I'd love to hear from you. You can email us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or look for us all over social media. Just search for EWTN Pro-Life. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.